Betty is not only an author and a radio show host, she is a life changer. I'm proud to present a very remarkable woman, Annie O'Sullivan. Hi, this is Annie O'Sullivan. I'm the author of My Story of Abuse, Can You Hear Me Now? And in recognition of uh, April, which is Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month, we, my friends and I, other, other activists, are putting together a program that we're calling the Duct Tape Project. We are asking for selfies or have your friend take your photograph and um, put, have duct tape over your mouth and we'd like it to say, abuse is silent, uh, child abuse is silent, abuse no more. Um, we've had some pictures, I've got about 100 pictures that have come in so far and um, you know, just, just be yourself. Uh, I've got some stuff that's really artistic. I've got some pictures that have come in with stories. And uh, I, we need a lot of pictures. What the plan is, is to put this video out over April and for people to, for, so that people can be aware of the numbers of, uh, of, of, of victims. Um, I think that you go from being a victim to being a survivor and uh, these pictures, you can't look at these pictures that have come in so far without understanding the impact that it has just in the United States alone. I represent 94 million people in the United States alone, 2 billion people over the entire world. Um, that's a lot of people and that's a lot of people that feel alone and my hope is that this project will bring people together. Um, I'd like to thank everybody that has sent in their photos and their stories. Uh, the hope of this project is that it will start a conversation. Many, many of you um, did exactly that and sent pictures. Your children got involved. You put their pictures were sent in. Uh, some kids sent in uh, their artwork. So uh, the marvelous thing about that is is they saw their parents doing something and they, they asked the question and the parents sat down and had a conversation with their children. That's what this is about, conversation and awareness. You can't eradicate child sexual abuse by sticking your head in the sand and looking the other way. You have to have a conversation. It has to be okay for your children to come to you and talk to you. You cannot assume that your children are going to come to you and have these conversations. As a society, we've made it pretty clear this is an ugly conversation and nobody wants to have it. If you can recognize that this is not the boogeyman down the street, it's not the ghost in the backyard, it's not the ugly person that's got a, a, a burn on their face, it's, it's, um, it's your, your, your mothers, your fathers, your aunts, your uncles, it's the people that are in your own family that you care about, it's, it's somebody, it could be your best friend. 98% of abuse is by a trusted family friend, family member or friend. And uh, my hope is that we turn Facebook duct tape silver. We need to be aware, and I want you to be aware, that the, um, the places that these predators lurk, for, for, for lack of a better word, are, um, they're in your churches, they're in your schools, they're, they're in camps. Um, you have to be vigilant. You cannot assume that you are in a safe environment with your child. Predators go where they're safe as well. And I, I know that when you go to church and you look around and you see everybody that you pray with and that you see every Sunday, you assume, you have made an assumption that those are safe people. They're not. They're not all safe. And that's an un unfortunate just fact of life. I was going to talk a, a minute about grooming behavior, um, which is what we call it. When an individual starts taking a special interest in your child, they get little gifts, they get special little trips, 
Um, you should be having a conversation with your child and be very careful not to put words into their mouths or into their brains, but the, the fact is for an adult to start paying special attention to a child that they have singled out is questionable behavior and you should be aware of that. Uh, they'll, that's how they earn your child's trust. And ultimately, because it is somebody who's close to the family, that child is not going to tell. It's, uh, you know, you hear all sorts of, of, of various ways that that happens. In my family, it was the threat of death. In uh, another activist uh, story, it was the threat that uh, your mom and dad are not going to believe you, and you're going to cause a lot of problems in the family or I'm going to molest your little sister. Of course, they don't use the word molest, but um, children are coerced very easily. And these are people that you trust. If you come in and they already trust you, to explain that from the point of view of a child, is you're already part of my family. I already know you. I already love you. And now you're sp spending extra time with me and you're giving me gifts and I get to go on little trips with you. And now you start to touch me. Well, it might feel a little weird at first, but, you know, it's a little hug. Or, you know, and then a couple of weeks down the road, it's, it's you know, it might be a, a little small version of an inappropriate touch. They don't just snag your child off the street and rape them. They work into this over a period of weeks and sometimes months before anything culminates and you have plenty of time to, to pay attention and, and ask the questions and, and just tell your make sure your children know what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. When an abuser is done, if you have more than one child, when, the, when they've decided that that child has gotten too old or they've outgrown the child for one reason or another, they will move on to your next child because now it's been established in your family that you're not going to look. As many of you know, I do a radio show, and one of my guests talked about uh, he was in the system for foster care, and uh, he was groomed for months. Um, ultimately, he was placed with this adult who, who he'd become very close to, and within a month of, of being placed in the home, he was, he was being sexually abused. It's important to have conversations with all of your children. If one of your children has been targeted by a pedophile, child molester, you know, all of these are very mild words for what's happening to, to your child. But if, if he's targeted one of your children, the chances are very high that or he or she will target another one of your children because it's been established now you trust this individual and they they will outgrow your child and they'll move on to the next one Hi, this is Annie O'Sullivan. I have a radio show on Blog Talk. It's internet radio. I can be found at uh, www.blogtalkradio.com. Just look up Can You Hear Me Now with Annie O'Sullivan. I have a show every week and we focus on healing. Uh, we have guests. I've had psychotherapists. I've had other people who share their stories and how they got past it. Have people who come on and talk about their own therapy. Uh, I have people who talk about, you know, they've written books. It, it, I've got a motivational speaker coming on in a couple of weeks. Uh, we just do a little bit of everything, but um, all of it, all of it is to help you heal. One of the things that I'd like to make really clear is this doesn't go away just because you grew up. 
Um, it didn't go away just because I grew up. I have logged in over 10 years of my own therapy. I still go back from time to time. Uh, we call them little tune-ups. I, I might have a little issue or you know something might be bothering me. And I'll grant you that my abuse was, was quite violent and severe. But I'm also going to tell you that it happens to a lot more people than you would think. And it's happening right under your nose. Some people go to therapy for 20 years. Some people never get over it. Um, it affects your life. Physically, it affected my life. I had surgery, uh, it'd be seven months ago now. I ended up with three cadaver bones in my neck. I have internal damage. I had trouble having children. None of this was visible to anybody my entire life. These are, these are the things that child abuse does. This is what happens when, you, when a small child is sexually violated. It's a small body. It's not meant for these sorts of things to happen. So you carry that the rest of your life. No matter how wonderful your life turns out, and my life has turned out quite well. I want to make that point that my life has turned out fairly well. Um, but that's not always the case. It's a lot of work. The shame. The shame has really been pushed home to me with this project. I've had people, they, they want to participate in the duct tape photo project. And um, I've had, I had someone who constructed a, a, a mask for the top part of their face and they put the tape over and you'll see that photo uh, because they didn't want anybody to know who they were. Um, I've had people, um, I've had people contact me and say, oh, I can't show my face. This is such an awful thing that happened. Can I just put some tape on my, on my arm uh, and, and say abuse no more? And it, in the beginning, I was pretty adamant that, you know, I wanted, I wanted duct tape on your mouth. And what I have discovered with this is um, people want to participate and they want to participate in their own way. Um, I've gotten stories and... Um, you know, when a when an eighty year old woman sends you a picture with a duct tape over her mouth and you can see the pain in her eyes, when you look at these pictures, I want you to look at look at their eyes. Forget about the tape. Look at their eyes, and you can see it. Um, they're looking for validation. They're looking for acceptance, and they're looking for people to just accept them for who they are, regardless of what happened to them. You just it's it's hard it's hard to explain the shame and the guilt that you carry as an adult for something that was done to you, not something that you did, and that's wrong. This project is bringing survivors together in a really big way, uh, in ways that I didn't, I didn't see coming. What I wanted to do was have a project that didn't cost a lot of money. Uh, we're talking about hard economic times. This is not our guilt and it's not our shame. It belongs to somebody else. We're lucky today. We have you. I know. Annie Does O'Sullivan. Get any better? <laughs> <laughs> you have changed so many lives. It's incredible. What you are doing is really gutsy. I know that you're aware, but I don't know that our audience is aware of how many people are sexually molested as children and then the child the child carries the guilt because no one will validate the child sure. I've talked to people that have told me that they told their parent that they were being molested and their parent said don't tell anybody what will the neighbors think you know I uh, just had breakfast two weeks ago with a woman and um, she told me her story and uh, she had been molested by her grandfather and she told her mother and her mother said to her are you sure that you're telling the truth because if you're lying 
Grandpa will go to jail. And she looked at her mother and said, I just made it up. And I asked her, how did you feel? I mean, she was 12 years old. Right. She said uh, that she walked away, she went down the hallway, and she was crying. And I said, well, how did you feel? You know, what were you thinking? Because this is a profound memory for her. She, she, right. And uh, she said, I knew I was alone. From that moment on, I knew nobody had my back. I was alone. Twelve years old. And this is so common. I wish that I could say that that story is, is, you know, that's just something that happened. You know, it doesn't happen all the time. But it does. It happens over and over and over. It's, uh, we love Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe wouldn't do that to you. Are you sure you just, you're not just making this up? Are you sure you didn't misunderstand what happened? You, and when you start pushing a child, um, they'll fold. You know, that's what you want to hear. You've made it quite clear. You're their caretaker. You know, whatever capacity that is, as, as an aunt, an uncle, a foster parent, uh, uh, whoever you are to this child, they have come and they have told you something, and you have made it pretty clear that it is not an acceptable story, and you're not going to run with it. You're not going to protect them. And they shut down. Kids are um, much more sophisticated than people give them credit for. They get it. You're not going to help me. I was speaking with an author of another book who was molested as a child, the author. And she told her father who was molesting the children, her and others. And he told her... Don't you say anything about that. You will be responsible for breaking up his family. Yeah. If they take his children and his wife leaves, it'll be your fault. It's That's what great. he told her. You can't believe the things that people say to children. They say things like that. They say, uh, well, I know I was told. Well, my father told me he would kill me, and I believed him. Right. I had plenty of reason to believe him. Um, I was told that my mother would hate me, and uh, to make things worse, I mean, for me, um, I didn't have, my, uh, my mother was strangely jealous of me as a child, and I, I never really got that, but my father would buy me, I mean, I was prostitute in his eyes. Right. You know, he would buy me things, um, uh, you know, things that my family could not afford would show up. For me to have and um, rather than my mother um, having the argument with my father she would get angry with me you know I wanted these boots I you know I hesitate to say this because it's gonna really let you guys all know how old I am but I wanted go-go boots really <laughs> bad <laughs> I wanted them and um, and uh, I got them and it was made really crystal clear that I had earned them. I earned them out in the middle of a hurricane in a cornfield with my father. And um, kids live in the moment. Um, I slept in those boots because by God they were mine. And I understood that I earned them. I didn't understand the dynamics of how it was wrong in, in society, socially, Morally, I didn't, I didn't understand that. I knew that something was happening to me that I didn't like. And I knew that it was a secret, just big secret. But I also had those boots I wanted so bad. And um, I think that, you know, as, as a kid, you're like, well, you know, this is, this is happening and this is really awful. And, and, and you're in that moment. Well, then it's over. Now you're in the next moment. And that is a survival mechanism. Um, you can't live in that ugly moment forever. You can't stay there. You would shrivel up and die. Of course. Um, kids are so uh, remarkably strong. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, you hear a lot, um, I didn't have sisters, um, but I hear on a regular basis from, from girls who had younger sisters that if you don't do this, I'm going to go get your sister. 
I'm gonna go get little Mary and you know I'm gonna get what I want one way or the other and so this child will comply and um, and, and, and I use, you know, I know that women do this too, it's the, and I have plenty of stories where mothers were doing things to their children. Um, the, the truth is, is I just hear so many more about men doing it to children. Um, I'm just going to use this as an example. I, I really would like to be gender neutral, but, but I find that really difficult with this. Um, but as an example, if you were to stumble into a situation where a woman was being violently raped. Would you step in and say, rape me? Take me. Take me and leave her. Children do that. Children do that every day. Um, I, I would like to say that, you know, they are true warriors. That's a true warrior that does that. And kids do it. Well, children are usually instinctively caring and protective of their younger siblings. They learn yeah. that from the day that baby is born and they stand by it more than most adults. They do. They do and I hear it. I hear it over and over and over. Um, I know um, that really didn't happen in my house. Um, it was every man for himself at my house but a lot of that had to do with um, my father was my father was a true sociopath. And, um, but he kept us all very separate, you know. We didn't talk to each other about what was going on. And there were horrendous things going on to, to each of us. And as an adult, and um, since my books come out, um, I've, I've heard a few things. And, and I don't talk about my brothers, and, and I won't do that, because it's not their story. It's not my story to tell. Um, but I, I know that horrible things happened to them, and we never talked about it and even as adults. Other than one of my brothers filled in a lot of holes for me because I have um, had great gray areas in my life that I just I couldn't remember. Um, and, and they would fill in some stuff and, and kind of made it make more sense for me. But we did not protect each other at all. It was like, something's happening to you and I am so out of here. We'd leave. Um, because the focus wasn't on me. I'd make sure I left because when my father got done with my brother, I was next, or vice versa. So you know the uh, the it's, it's really sad because I mean I I'm virtually an orphan now because when we see each other, um, it's just too much pain. It brings it's, back all the memories. It comes back. I mean, what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about the Christmas tree that somebody got hit with? Or are we going to talk about, you know, the Christmas that our, our Christmas presents got thrown into the fireplace and, and we got called names that, you know, most people don't even say out loud to anyone, much less their children. Um, you know, are we going to talk about, uh, well, you know, here's one, you know, th these are not funny stories. We're not, we're not going to sit around and, <clears throat> you know, have a couple of beers and sit around and, 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 and laugh about, you know, my dad using cats for target practice or us. You know, some of this stuff didn't make it into the book. Uh, we were used for target practice with a BB gun. He had a high-powered BB gun. And um, there were times when pellets had to be removed from, you know, your butt. Because you got you got hit and and you know and, and that that was not funny. It was not funny to run around the yard. So we don't have, you know, we're not going to sit around and talk about our family reunion that we went to. They weren't fun. They were they were horrific. So we all grow up and you know kind of go our separate ways. And um, there's an attempt from time to time to to talk. Um, but it just doesn't happen. Um, when I was in my 20s, I had, uh, you know, I kind of floated around with church and I thought it was important for my kids and I, I went to a, um, went to a Catholic church and I was ready to commit 
because I felt like it was important for my children to, to belong to something that was bigger than them. And uh, even when I talk about bad luck, I run into a priest who called me a child harlot. Called me a child, child harlot. And it's like, I'm never going back to church again. I had also been molested by a, church, by a priest that was a friend of my father's. So not only was it hard for me to go, you know, I made a great leap of faith going in. And it was the first time that I had ever seriously sat down and said, I have problems. I have problems and I'm trying to overcome them and, and I'm trying to find I'm trying to find the road, you know, to redemption, I guess. And uh, clearly I didn't go to the, back to church for a very long time. Um, I, it's it's a your massive uh, denial here. Whenever an adult has sex with a child, it is always the fault of the adult. Of the I don't care what the child did. The adult's supposed to act oh, yeah. like an adult. It's um, and it's it's kind of pervasive, and 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 there's things that are going on in um in society. I mean, I am not going to name this show, but I'm I'm pretty sure everybody knows the show. I I've, I've never watched. <laughs> But um, they dress this kid up. I mean, she's, what, seven? They've got makeup on her, and they fix her hair, and it's, you know, <clears throat> we sexualize young children, and we put them in these situations. And I'm, there's a whole population of people out there who find that very attractive. And we're, we're pandering to that in the name of money. We're going to make money. Um, it's not cute. I personally, I, I think it's a tragedy that we have a society today that even thinks it's cute. It's not cute. You know, it's cute when your six-year-old is at home playing dress-up in a trunk. And, 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 and that's part of learning who they are and figuring that out. But when you put a child on display as, as if they were 17 or 18 years old, that's a sickness in society that... I don't even know what to say about that. You know, you can fill in your own blank how you feel about that. Um, it's wrong. Well, coming from your experience, and you're having been sexualized as an object as a child, seeing things that would amp that up has to be painful for you. It has to be. Um, painful. I can't get past being outraged outraged um it's you know what i find painful is is the stories that i hear thank you annie thank you for being you it is always a pleasure to have you here